So it's important to be thinking about this time of year. Okay, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, we're studying the grace panorama, the overview of grace. One of the best sections of Ephesians. I love it. But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. Use the rebound technique if needed. Just simply 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's bow our heads for just a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the time that we have here on earth in phase two. Father, we're praying for our military men and women around the world who are fighting for our freedom. We pray you protect them, encourage them. We pray for our policemen and women here inside America that you would continue to give them the ability to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom. We pray for our leadership in America that you could continue to raise up men who could guide our country towards more and more freedom. We pray for our friends in the Philippines and the ones who have been affected by the earthquakes. Father, we pray that you would protect our friends and remind them of the faith rest drill. Father, we pray for our friends on the prayer list, the ones that are sick. We pray that You'd heal them, whether it be by medicine or by miracle. For our friends who are in pain, Father, we pray You would relieve them, their pain. Remind them of Your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who are grieving the loss of loved ones, Father, we pray You be with them in their grief. Remind them of Your precious promises which bring the peace that passes all understanding. We thank You and praise You for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We started a very powerful verse last week which tells us that God's plan includes the future. We saw the very first phrase in the ages to come. And I want to remind you that God's plan is rolling like a great wheel and it's going somewhere. It's headed a direction. And it's going to continue to be fulfilled in human history. And the question for all of us is, are we in on God's plan and are we riding on the cart or will we be crushed by the great wheel as God's plan continues to roll on. So, your attitude towards Bible doctrine will answer that. In the ages to come, there is a future in God's plan. We're headed somewhere. And so we have a personal sense of destiny. This is one of the most powerful, promise, uh, powerful prom problem-solving devices there is. We have a destiny in Christ. In the ages to come, He, that is God the Father, might show or might display the exceeding riches, the plutos, the magnificent riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And what this verse is telling us is is that God doesn't mind picking up a, dumb, a dummy along the way and pouring out His grace in their lives so that He can show in the future what happens when even a dummy gets in on His plan. You see that? 
When I say dummy, I'm including myself. When he picks up hammerheads like me, and he can show what happens when we get in on his plan. He will have us on display for all of eternity. But what happens when we tap into God's grace? What happens when we send our roots into His grace? What happens when we exploit the grace of God? And the truth is, God doesn't mind a fixer-upper. I am I'm the world's worst about collecting junk because I see the potential in it. That's antique. But look what would happen if you fixed it up. And my wife is looking at something full of rust holes and everything else and saying, that is a clunker. I don't know what you see in that. That thing needs so much work. You'll never get around to that. That's what she sees and what she says. And she's probably right. But what I see is the potential. And we're coming up on verse 10 where we're going to see we're His workmanship. And what is better than dragging something out of the boneyard, out of the junkyard, that is totally ruined and fixing it up to show quality standards? You see... And this is our verse and what he's speaking of. So I want to stop and review something with you that we see in our verse. In verses 6 and 7. In verse 6 it says, And He raised us up together and seated us in the heavenlies in Christ. And so in the top circle, God identifies us with Strategic victory. See, Jesus won the strategic victory of the first advent, and we're identified, we're baptized into it. It's two of our identifications here. When we were taken out of Adam in spiritual death and placed in Christ, we became identified with strategic victory. So you have here the capacity. This gives us the capacity. It's only potential though. This gives us the capacity to be tactical. To claim the tactical victory. So it gives us capacity, or you could use the word potential. We have the potential because of this. Now, when we get in on God's plan for our life, we learn about a spiritual life that He has given us. And this is where we claim the tactical victory. See, strategic is the large game plan. Tactics are individual or small groups. And when you think of tactics, you're thinking of your own life inside the divine dinosphere or your life inside the local church. See, this is our platoon here. Small group. We haven't, we haven't developed into a battalion yet. So our potential doesn't come become a reality until we get in on Bible doctrine. Bible doctrine clues us in to what the spiritual life really is and what the unique life of the church age is. So every born again believer has the potential. The question is, are they claiming it as a reality? And the reality is only produced right here. (coughs) 
So we used the illustration last week of Israel going through the Red Sea. They were delivered from Egypt. Two million adults walked through the Red Sea, dry shod, born again adults. They had the potential. They were all born again. And yet we found they spent 40 years in the desert, and out of two million, how many walked across the Jordan? Two. <laughs> So that when you view Christianity, you need to recognize while two million Israelites crossed the Red Sea dry shod and they saw the miracle and they saw that God can deliver and they saw the, the power of God's deliverance that only two walked across the Jordan dry shod and inherited the promised land. Caleb and Joshua. So don't get your eyes on other people. The buzzards are going to pick their eyes out. You see that? Don't worry about it. It's your job to keep the right attitude and not to maribah in this life. I'm going to stop and tell you that's what separates you from the rest of humanity. Everybody else out here is belly aching. We live in the best period of human history in modern times. You, you couldn't believe the conveniences that we have compared to a hundred years ago. Just the medicine we have available to us now is modern day miracle. The conveniences of life. That we, that we have now are just miraculous. And yet if you interview people, here's what you're going to find. They've got a list of complaints that goes down for pages. And they bellyache and whine all along the way. And so what you find out about Caleb and Joshua is the fact when they viewed the giants, they didn't see the giants. They saw God's promise. They said, it's a good and fruitful land which God has given us to inherit. Let us take hold of it. Let us take possession of it. They weren't worried about the giants. God could take care of that. You know what everybody else did? They belly ached. They were scared. So while every born-again Christian has the potential and the identification that can carry them, the math tells us that two out of two million are going to make it. So don't get your eyes on others. Then we looked at the fact that if we're going to make it, I want to give you, we're going to have to Habituate the new man response. Now the new man has a residence. It's the bottom circle. But what we want to do is get used to doing the right thing in the right way. And this is the 40 years in the desert. You come to the problem and you use a doctrinal response. And we see the testing of Israel in the desert. And many times it came down to the faith rest drill. God will supply. They hit a no water situation. There was no water. They were going to thirst to death. But <clears throat> God delivered them. And they should have known He could have done it because he, he split the sea wide open for them to walk through. 
Can He not give them water? So Caleb and Joshua learned the faith rest drill. And what happened was is they learned to trust Him so many times that they habituated the truth. In other words, there was no situation where they would not trust God, even in death. And Job said this, even though I, He slay me, yet shall I trust in Him. See, that ought to be you. That is habituating a new man response to every aspect of life. And that's what gives you the ability to walk around on Mindanao with the ground shaking. And be an absolute warrior in the angelic conflict. I'm trusting in God in every situation. Once you've done the right thing in the right way 20 times in a row, then it becomes a subconscious application of the truth. You don't even have to think about it. Now the reason I'm saying this is because that's what it takes to get into ultra super grace. See, super grace is entering the desert and learning about the problem solving devices and maybe failing and maybe never getting out of no man's land. But once you've got those problem solving devices and when a problem comes up, you can just simply pull out the right one and chop off the problem's head right there without even thinking about it. Then you're ready to advance and fight the giants. See, that happens in ultra super grace. So here's what I want for you. I want for you, I want two things. First, you have to tap the grace of God. And the Bible puts it many ways. It, it, it tells us to sink our roots down into the marvelous grace of God like a plant. And that's where the nutrients are, see, that's going to feed us, sustain us. And that's a beautiful illustration. Last week I used the term to exploit the grace of God. And that's a good one because He has showered us with His mercy and kindness, the Bible says. So we've got to learn how to lean on the grace of God, to exploit the grace of God, to send our roots down into the grace of God in this life. It's only grace that can carry us through this life. You can't carry you. God's going to make sure of that. He's going to break you to the point where you've got to find it. See, Paul, he tried to pray. And that, wasn't the, that was the wrong application. It says he prayed three times. And God wouldn't take away the thorn in the flesh. And you know what God told him? My grace is sufficient for you. He didn't take the thorn away. He said, you lean on my grace. So what I want for every one of you is to be able to tap into that grace and lean on it. Rely on the grace of God. And He's going to show you how to do it. And the more hard-headed you are, the farther He's going to break you down get you to find it. I'll stop and pause right there for a minute. Because I'm hard-headed. And I've almost died twice. First I got tick fever and I couldn't even hold my head up. And then I got a poisonous sm a snake bite and almost died again. And I guarantee you, my book, Christian Suffering, is dog-eared all the way through. And you know why? I'm hard-headed. But I'll stop and tell you, by golly, I found out how to lean on the grace of God. When you come to the end of yourself, you'll find out it's the only thing that'll carry you.
And so you can suffer in misery until you find out how to tap into God's grace, and you'll find out it's the only thing that can carry you through this life. And then the second thing that I want for all of you is that you become a warrior in the angelic conflict. See, you've got to learn how to tap into God's grace and you've got to learn how to fight. Too many Christians just lay down when they run into problems. And if you're going to be a Caleb or you're going to be a Joshua in the angelic conflict, you're going to have to learn how to fight the giants. You see? You can't, you can't be shrinking back in fear. You're going to have to learn how to be bold and brave in the angelic conflict. And See, the good thing is, is that you kill the mosquito the same way you kill the charging buffalo. And God will let you kill the mosquito 20 times in the desert before He puts you in front of a charging buffalo in the promised land. He'll let you develop your confidence in small little steps until you have to face that black death. That's the buffalo. So every one of you are going to have to learn how to fight. You see, Paul says... We're in a spiritual battle. And so what we're going to continue to learn about is God's grace. We're going to move on into verse 8 because it continues the same theme that we've been studying. Let's take a look at it. I'm going to have to go back here. I need to hit this button. We're going to start out with the hard part. I know that uh, sometimes it's rather monotonous to get through the exegesis, but this is these two verses are such great verses that you are not going to mind. Now, we had the question before we started class this morning, what caused the Dark Ages? What caused the Dark Ages? Because we know that when Jesus died and was resurrected, that He sent out the Gospel to all parts of the earth. and In fact, the Bible indicates that the entire civilized world was evangelized in the first couple hundred years. And isn't it perfect how God's timing, the Romans had built roads, and technology had come around to the point where travel was uh, available. And the gospel traveled with great speed. But what caused the dark ages? It wasn't, we didn't run into big problems until we moved the church into the government buildings. And guess what the government buildings were? They were worship centers for the gods. And inside the government buildings, there was always statues. Apollos, Dionysus, Greek gods, Roman gods. And as the church members moved their churches into the giant government buildings, which were so nice and so much nicer than the catacombs and the, the creek banks that they'd been preaching on, they said, well, look at this marvelous statue. I hate to get rid of all of these. Surely this one looks like, hmm, Mary instead of Artemis or Dionysus. And so let's call this one Mary and we'll leave it here. 
Well, that's where you get state-funded religion. And eventually, it devolved into Roman Catholicism. And as soon as Roman Catholicism figured out they had power. You see, it's just like our politicians now. How can we make ourselves more powerful? Well, you tell someone, you can't make it without me. And I'll let you know whether you're worthy of heaven or not. And so you find out that their doctrine was satanic doctrine and you had to pay your way into heaven. You could tithe to the church and deliver people from hell. Oh, it was terrible. And so we fell into the dark ages. And it was the dark ages spiritually because the grace of God was concealed. And I don't mind telling you, when I went down to Texas, I read two verses first to my Roman Catholic congregation that was there. And that was Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His mercy He saved us the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then I read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I looked out at those people there and I said, God does the saving and we do the receiving. And salvation is a gift. And all God requires from us is faith. And it was, as, it was just like Martin Luther tacking up his notes upon the church door where he was challenging And so as we begin studying these verses, they may be, they, you may understand them, they may frequently fly through your mind, but I'm telling you, there, is a, there are millions of people upon the earth that are blinded to the grace of God. And they are literally working their fingers to the bone to try to get to heaven. They'll give the church every penny they've got, every spare moment they've got, and they, you talk to them and they, they come to the end of their life and they say, I don't know if I'll make it or not. And I actually talked to an elderly gentleman there who told me that while I was at the service. I don't know if I'll make it or not. Isn't that terrible? So at Grace Bible Church, one of the reasons we named it Grace Bible Church is because we have grace theology. And we base our theology on the grace of God. It's our first premise is that God treats mankind in grace. That is His policy. And when we look at all areas of Scripture, we base it off the premise of grace. So that when you see a verse like Matthew 24, 13, and it says, He who endures to the end shall be saved. See, that doesn't sound like grace to me. So what does it mean? And then we find out the context tells us that Jesus is telling the Jews he who can live through the tribulation in a physical body and make it to the second advent will be delivered from physical death.
You see, every piece of Scripture that we approach, we have the premise of grace. And so you need to remember at least three verses that are mainstays in our Bible, in our teaching, in our classes. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Titus 3, 5. In Romans chapter 3, verses 25, 26, and 27. And Martin Luther himself, which brought the age of enlightenment and brought us out of the dark ages, guess what book he studied? Romans. And he found that man was justified by faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. And so what we want to do is deliver whoever may be listening out here from any form of legalism which they may be suffering through. And one of the ways we're going to do that is to look at the exegesis. We're going to exegete our verses here considering the grammar, the syntax, and the etymology. We're going to find a little deeper meaning than we have in the English. The first word we have in the English is for. It's the explanatory use of the conjunctive particle gar. And so it should be translated not for, but now you see. So he's going to explain something to us. He's going to explain to us how we're totally reliant on the grace of God. For you see, by grace is the instrument of, instrumental singular of chorus plus the definite article. Could be translated by the grace. Grace refers to the plan of God as emanating from the character of God. The definite article denotes previous reference to grace, which was mentioned in verse 5. Definite article may be used to point out an object to identity, of the identity of which is defined by some previous reference made to it in context. Grace is the operating principle of God's plan. Grace is the way in which God can provide all things for us which He designed to provide for us in eternity past without ever compromising His own character and at the same time glorifying Himself. So grace is the only principle to the plan of God because grace means that God is responsible. God does the work. God does the providing. To keep His plan perfect, God must do all the work and all the thinking and take all the credit. Therefore, the exclusion of man's work in the plan. We're going to look at the doctrine of human good and the doctrine of divine good before this is over with. And I've <clears throat> explained this to you many times. But if you take totally depraved, lost mankind, and he stinks to high heaven, okay? What from him can God take for salvation? Not much. He doesn't want your dirty, stinking, filthy works. See, God can do anything. What he wants from unsaved mankind is faith. Faith alone in Christ alone because faith is non-meritorious. Anyone can believe. And it's the only thing acceptable to God's righteousness. Anything else is totally repulsive to God. And so you see, God, God's grace policy protects His own essence. Are you saved is the perfect paraphrastic and is erroneously translated. A 
Periphrastic is always made up of a participle plus the indicative mood. In this case, we have the present active indicative of the verb imi. Then with that is the perfect passive participle of sozo. The two of them together create a perfect periphrastic. The perfect tense is the intensive perfect, which emphasizes the results of a finished product. The passive voice, mankind, is the beneficiary. Mankind receives the action of the verb. The participle indicates the permanence of the periphrastic. The next word, gar, should be trans not be translated for, but now you see. And so he, the better phraseology would be, now you see by the grace you have been permanently saved. So the word sozo is perfect passive. It's translated saved in your Bible. It ought to be translated permanently saved at one moment in time, really. So we have eternal security in our verse. It's only apparent when you study the Greek. Next, the means of appropriation is emphasized as a non-meritorious function through faith. It's dia plus the genitive of genitive singular of pistis. There's no definite article here. The absence of the definite article gives great emphasis to the noun faith. It emphasizes the qualitative aspect of the noun rather than its identity. The quality of faith is non-meritorious and yet totally efficacious because of the object of faith. You see, faith always has an object in salvation. It's Jesus Christ on the cross. The definite article with the noun emphasizes the identity. But there is no definite article here so faith is emphasized as a non-meritorious system of perception. A system whereby we can never receive any credit at any time. And that's why Jesus says, it's the faith of a child. Very simple, very trusting type of faith. One of my former pastors would ask the question, how much faith does it take to be saved? A little more than none at all. That's a good answer. Jesus says, the faith of a mustard seed shall move mountains. And the reason he said that is because in the angelic conflict, when even one person is born again, it's a huge event. It's one more nail in Satan's coffin. It means that God is vindicated. By the faith the size of a mustard seed. And that is the next phrase. It's not correct. We have the ascensive use of chi, which should be translated even. Then we have the demonstrative pronoun, the nominative neuter of hutos. The neuter gender is the problem here because faith is in the masculine gender and grace. But here we have the neuter. It should be translated even this, not and that. The demonstrative pronoun calls attention with special emphasis to the designated object. And the demonstrative pronoun is used for something relatively near in the context. But in this neuter gender, the demonstrative pronoun excludes the possibility of anything in the context because they are feminine gender, not neuter. So here is a hanging demonstrative pronoun to indicate that the entire plan of God, 
The demonstrative pronoun emphasizes the importance of the planner rather than the mechanics of the plan. The mechanics of the plan are outlined, but they are not nearly as important as the planner. And so we see God the Father as the planner of salvation from eternity past. And when he asked himself in all of his brilliance, what could I accept from totally depraved man if I want him to be saved forever? Hmm, let me calculate this. There's got to be something that he can't mess up that I can accept from him. Oh, wait. Pistis as a system. Faith. Non-meritorious. Anybody can do it. And so it points to the great genius of God in developing a system for salvation in which man takes none of the credit. God receives all the glory. Amen. Not is the negative particle ook. This word is spelled three different ways. O-U-K, O-U, and O-U-X. Each spelling of the negative depends on how it is used in the sentence. Ook, O-U-K, is used before words beginning with vowels. O-U is used before words beginning with consonants. Then O-U-X is used before words beginning with vowels which have a rough breathing. But it is always the same negative. So it is even this definitely not of yourselves is the preposition ek plus the ablative plural of su. This means not out from the source of you all. That means this salvation did come from you, brother. Get over it. Not from you. Then the true source is given. It's the gift of God. This is the ablative of source of theos. And it should be translated from God. Plus the word for gift. Here denotes a gift which could never be earned or deserved. Doron. In the Koine Greek, when it is desired to apply a sense of an abstract noun in some special and distinct way, it is again preceded by the definite article, as here. As an abstract noun which has a distinct meaning. The gift. A gift that God can never retract. So we see that salvation is a gift from God. A gift that He will never take back. So let's see a corrected translation of verse 8. Now you see by the grace of God, you have been permanently saved through faith. Even this salvation is not out from the source of you. It is a free gift from the source of God which will never be revoked. So we have a good translation of verse 8. And what we found out is two very relieving things. That faith alone in Christ alone is what saves and that we can never lose our salvation. Pretty great verse. Well, we've been delivered by the dark ages, and it's through Bible doctrine that we've been delivered. We're going to continue looking at Ephesians 2, 8, and then we're going to take a look at verse 9. We're going to bring up some summary points. Right after a break, let's take a five-minute break. Is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, the man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
We've got a couple of points of summary after we finished our translation of verse 8. And we found out that God does the saving. It's a gift from Him. And we can never lose our salvation. And it's received through a non-meritorious faith alone in Christ alone. This gives us the concept of strategic victory. We might have a better understanding of our relationship to our life on this earth. Strategic victory occurred at the cross, resurrection, ascension, and session because Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and we're entered into union with Him. We share in the strategic victory. And being shares in the strategic victory, the objective of phase two is, in, is to enter into the tactical victory of the super grace life. This is only possible as we utilize the grace of God available to us. We look at the three phases of God's plan, we'll see grace in every one of them. The question in phase one is, what do you think of Christ? Is He Savior or is He not? The issue in phase two is, what do you think of Bible doctrine? That determines whether you will receive the tactical victory in the angelic conflict. Finally, there is surpassing grace in phase three, which is the inheritance and portion of every believer. So what you're finding out is there's grace in every phase of God's plan. Phase one is an unbeliever. You have common grace and saving grace. See, common grace means that God will get you to the gospel or the gospel to you if you're positive and that God the Holy Spirit will stand in the place of your lacking human spirit and make the gospel perspicuous. Saving grace is the work that Jesus did on the cross to deliver your soul from hell. See, that's phase one grace. God did all the work. But once you're born again, you have a new objective. Tactical victory. And you may say, well, where's the grace in that? I'm going to say you're covered up with it. Just think about oxygen. Did you have to worry about oxygen this morning? No, it never crossed your mind. And yet God provided every molecule of oxygen you would need for this day. For your brain to function. The food, the water, the transportation, the heating and the air conditioning in this building and shelter from the outside. His Word, 66 books of perfection. All the spiritual gifts needed in the local church to make it work. Look, the freedom that you enjoyed. It's all grace and you're covered up with it, but you can't see it because you're so arrogant. You see, God has showered us with His grace, with His kindness, with His compassion, with His mercy. And it's just like watering those flowers out there in the flower bed. He wants to see you grow. That's the purpose of His grace. And then all that is needed from you is a little positive volition. A little positive attitude towards His Word. I asked those people in the graveyard there, I guess that was Wednesday, I put them on the spot. I had them right there under a tent. I asked them, what are you doing to get the truth in your soul? You see, you can't pound it in this way. 
You've got to receive it somehow. And while reading your Bible is okay, you'll become confused. So God has provided a pastor teacher with a spiritual gift that can study and teach the Word of God where you can understand it. And that's grace. So in phase two, we're covered up with grace. And eventually you're going to find this. You will reap where God has sown. And it's grace and grace and grace upon grace. And then finally, at the end of our lives, we'll receive dying grace. That's walking across the golden drawbridge called physical death. It's the death shadow valley where you and the Lord are there. And since you simply walk with Him all the days of your life, now He says, why don't you come home with me today? So it's at home face to face with the Lord. Another part of surpassing grace is the resurrection body and rewards for eternity. And so the Christian way of life is covered with grace. By the way, our objective in phase two is to reach super grace, no man's land, and then to advance across the desert and cross the Jordan in this life and slay the giants in ultra super grace. So we're covered up with grace, friends. And Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells us we started with grace and we're going to end with grace. Now the question is, who is glorified? God did the work of salvation and we believed non-meritoriously. Who's glorified? God is. We walk into the Christian way of life and God provides everything we need for spiritual growth, including Bible doctrine. And all we got to do is show up. Who's glorified? We take a problem-solving device like the faith rest drill and we apply it to our lives and we lose all sense of worry, all anxiety, stomach ulcers. Nervousness. We're benefited, but who's glorified? God is. We receive a resurrection body like Christ. Maybe a crown, but it's only because we got in on truth. Who's glorified? God is. You see, God's grace policy makes sure in the end that He is glorified and He is the only one worthy of glorification because He is the only one perfect. And we are not. And so in verse 9, is very short and it wraps up God's grace policy towards mankind. Not is the first word in the English. In the Greek, it's the negative ook again to deny the reality of an alleged statement works it's act plus the ablative plural of ergon and it means not out from the source of works look here Roman Catholics wake up your priest is lying to you you can't buy your salvation there is no purgatory. There is no limbo. The apocrypha is false. It's full of false doctrine. Doesn't matter how many Hail Marys you've done. Doesn't how much, matter how much penance you do. What you give up for Lent. None of these works can save you. It's Jesus Christ upon the cross. Not out from the source of works, ergon. And it gives us a reason why. Lest 
is nama, which introduces a negative final clause. Ma is the subject type negative, and it's not quite as strong. Any man is the next phrase. It's the indefinite pronoun tish, which represents a category of humanity that is those who seek to be saved by their own works, with the result that they can have a bragamony. Lest anyone is a better translation. So let's should boast is the next phrase. The aorist middle subjunctive of karakmai. The aorist tense is a cumulative aorist in which the event is viewed from the standpoint of its entirety but emphasized from the viewpoint of existing results. The result is that when everyone and anyone goes to heaven, there will be no boasting. This is the whole concept of salvation as well as everything else thereafter. In the plan of God, there is no place for human boasting. The middle voice, the subject acts with a view towards participating in the outcome. This is called a direct middle or reflexive middle. Not from the source of works that no one himself. The subjunctive mood is a potential subjunctive which is used to indicate a final clause in the Greek. So we have a good translation. Not from the source of works that no one should boast. There will be nobody in heaven who is boasting about how they got there. They will be pointing to the Lamb of God without spot and without blemish. Matter of fact, there's a song that's in Revelation that says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. So the only boasting in heaven will be boasting of what Christ has done for us. And that's beautiful because it really lets the air out of a lot of hot, uh, high-headed people who think they're doing great things for God. And we find out that human works have no place in the plan of God. And the only good that we get to do is what God foreordained before time began. And as a matter of fact, He planned it all out just so we could just step right into it and not even have to think about it and produce that good. So let's take a look at <clears throat> seven different types of work which are normally associated with salvation. Seven different kinds, categories. First, verbal works. Things like coming forward and acknowledging Christ publicly. Repenting, confessing, or begging God to save you. Or even inviting Christ into your heart. I love this one because, you know, <clears throat> they love to pull out the section of Scripture in, in Romans chapter 10 where it says, you know, with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. And they want to use... And it really, if you look at Romans in chapter 9 and 10, it's Jew-centric. It's Paul talking about his brethren. And in the context, he's using an Old Testament passage. And he's repeating it. But the problem with it is this. And if you go to a um, free will Baptist, a faith Baptist, you go to one of these churches, they love the ABCs of salvation. And man, they use it when they'll pull it out on you too, on the street. And they want you to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord unto salvation. And that's all good and fine. But you forget the context in which it's being preached from. It's Paul towards the Jews, and you're not a Jew. 
And then it omits a certain percentage of the earth. You know why? Some people are mute and they can't talk. Therefore, they go to hell. You see that? So you're going to omit mute people because they can't confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, they're wrong. That's verbal works. And by the way, in that passage, it says, one believe with the right lobe. Also, why don't they emphasize that? Because they want to get them down front and stick the microphone in their face and they want to prove that they're saved by some kind of works. Whenever you add works to faith, guess what you've done? You've neutralized the faith. It's like adding filthy rags to a dinner you're going to serve to God. Not acceptable. There's a law of works in in Romans chapter 3. It says that God justifies the one that believes. The second category of works is ritual like circumcision or baptism. The whole book of Galatians covers this. And yet some legalists like to pull a couple of verses out of Galatians and say that they mean you can lose your salvation when in fact the whole book of Galatians teaches you can't produce works for salvation and you can't produce works for spirituality. Paul really preaches in the whole book about those two things. So you can't do anything as far as rituals to be saved. The third is psychological works like raising a hand, walking an aisle, or jumping through some form of a psychological hoop. I have a good friend who's a Baptist pastor and he will tell you, he will say, as soon as you have the altar call, people stop thinking about Jesus and they begin to think about what other people are thinking about them. Is my dress wadded up in my pantyhose in the back? How's the back of my hair look? Do I have any cat hair on my dress? Do I have any lint? You know, is my makeup correct? Or my eye, my eyeshadow running? Or is my curls right today? What will I look like in front of the congregation? Will someone stand up and say, we don't want them? See, it's psychological. And I used to love a couple of Baptist pastors I knew who would say this, you tell God the Father you're believing in Christ for salvation right there in that pew. And that's when you inherit eternal life. And now then after, if you want to come forward and show others you have believed, you do so. And that's how you handle it. See, in the privacy of your own soul, you believe. The fourth kind or categories of work are corporate works, such as join the church, tithe, give money, work around the church for salvation. The fifth category is religious works, keeping the law or doing penance or recognizing the lordship of Christ. And the lordship salvation is a big crowd. They'll sneak up on you. You say this is a good preacher until you hear him get to certain places and he'll say, if Jesus Christ is not Lord of all in your life, He's not Lord at all. In other words, kill yourself for Jesus group. But watch this. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords whether you recognize it or not, you little human. He's enthroned in heaven no matter what you say. 
He is Lord over all. So this Lordship salvation is really just another angle on legalism. The sixth category of works is behavior improvement. Changing of behavior patterns from immoral to moral or giving up something in the taboo class. Like I got saved and stopped drinking. Look, there have been people on in my church on opioids where if they stopped taking them, they would get sick and possibly even die. And they may come in the door and believe in Christ, believe in Christ for salvation and have to take dope the next day. Because if they stop, they'll die. You see that? And yet these legalists say, oh, if you're a Christian, you, if you were really born again, you'd clean your life up and that wouldn't be a part of it. Well, I'm going to stop and tell you there's been a lot of bad people believe even those who may have been partially drunk or even partially high. And I'll stop and remind you that the thief upon the cross next to Jesus drank the wine mixed with gall, which was alcohol with dope in it to deaden the pain. And there upon the cross he believed in Jesus Christ and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Today you shall be with me in paradise. And he had wine and bitter gall in his body. So these self-improvement people, they really don't like to go to those, do they? The seventh category of works is emotional works, such as ecstatics, tongues, or anything where you get the rosy glow. These are all the negative side, and they're included in this phrase, not out from the source of works. So the beauty of the situation is this. We can do nothing and God has done everything. That means He's taking care of the details. God is perfect and we are imperfect. The only thing we have that can satisfy the righteousness of God at salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. And so grace is God's policy towards mankind. And in our Bible, we're going to find out that God tells us, as ye have received Christ, so also walk. We received Christ in grace, and after salvation, we continue to operate in the same policy of grace. And it's grace upon grace in the Christian way of life. God does the work, and we receive, and God gets the glory. And that's the way I like it. And that's the one reason our, our church is called Grace Bible Church. Grace is God's policy. Well, I thank you for your attention and attendance this morning. I know that it was hard.